I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. The meltdown had begun. It was a fire sale in Nauvoo to preserve what little bits of reputation that could be salvaged from the wreckage. The revelations were quickly coming to light across the country that threatened Joseph Smith and the church. How could they possibly stop the remainder of Bennett's exposés coming to the public eye? They couldn't. All that Joe and the rest of the Mormon elite could do was act out of self-preservation. It was all reactionary. The next issue of the Sangamo Journal, after the initial printing, reveals some interesting developments since Bennett's first letter had gone public the week before. The movements within Nauvoo were quite fascinating as well. Bennett wasn't alone in his dissent. He was just the most public and most willing to openly oppose Joe and the Nauvoo theocracy. Sidney Rigdon, you know, largely due to Joe locking his daughter Nancy in a room and forcefully propositioning her, along with Rigdon's son-in-law, George W. Robinson, Francis Higby, and all of these prominent figures in Nauvoo Mormonism were showing signs that they were fed up with it. One of the more notable of these prominent figures was Orson Pratt. Let's spend some time talking about Orson and his partner, Sarah Pratt, today. What happened with them? What happened with Sarah Pratt specifically? What caused her to become reviled in Mormon history as an angry apostate? Let's begin by examining the majority of Joe's wives up to this point. With only a few exceptions, most of Joe's wives were already married to other men in elite ranks. Founding Alger was an exception to this, but she's kind of been a bit of an exception to the entire trajectory of polygamy in general. But Eliza Snow was also an exception to this. But we have Lucinda Harris, Louisa Beeman, Zina Huntington, Prescindia Huntington, Agnes Coolbrith, Sylvia Sessions, Mary Rollins, Patty Sessions, Marin and Nancy Johnson. All of these women taken into marriage, into a plural marriage prior to summer of 1842 were all other men's wives, or were widows. Now, this had a few benefits in keeping marriage a secret. When Joe married other men's wives, they'd usually still continue to live with their first husband, and Joe wouldn't be responsible for supporting them financially or emotionally as an equal partner. Also, inevitably resulting pregnancies were concealed. Plus, Joe could try and keep the relationships secret from the women's husbands, or he could get the husbands in on the entire whole, you know, polygamy scheme with promises of eternal exaltation, access to the kingdom on high, and, you know, great mansions with progeny without number in the world to come. That's a pretty solid sales pitch for anyone who believed that Joe was the one true prophet and actually could grant those promises. But when Joe started marrying single women... That created an interesting set of ramifications for everybody involved. How would they be financially supported when their husband could never be spoken of to anyone? What if if they wanted to go on a date or go to a public dance where they would inevitably be courted, but they were already reserved by the prophet as one of his wives? What could these women do? What reason could they give for turning down a date? And beyond that, an unmarried woman in a very tight-knit insular group getting pregnant out of wedlock? Well, that had a whole mess of ramifications that are far too complex for us to tease apart here. All of these complications play a role in our discussion today. So what was the situation with Sarah Pratt? What happened with her and her marriage to Orson Pratt? Let's begin with a brief biographical sketch of Sarah. You'll find a link to the Joseph Smith Papers biography of Sarah Marinda Bates Pratt in the show notes. Sarah was born on February 5th, 1817 to Cyrus Bates and Lydia Harrington Bates. She'd been present along with her husband, Orson Pratt, for most events of church history since Orson Brainpower Pratt baptized her into the church in June of 1835. Orson Pratt was a member of Science Camp, and his participation resulted in induction into the Quorum of Apostles when it was organized in 1835. Orson Pratt and anybody attached to him, like Sarah, would enjoy elevated status in the church from that time forward. Orson and Sarah met while Orson had been proselytizing. He wrote this of their introduction, quote, 
Went to Brother Bates, found them all well. I was very much enjoyed to see them as I had been absent about one year, and more especially as I had previously formed an acquaintance with their daughter, with whom I had held a correspondence by letter, and with whom I shortly expected to enter into the sacred bonds of matrimony. End quote. I can't find their letter exchanges anywhere, unfortunately. They may exist somewhere in some, you know, rabbit hole of the internet, but I can't seem to find them. Regardless, Orson and Sarah were married a month after that journal entry. As is often the case with women in Mormon history, we're forced to track the movements of a person through their prominent significant other. This is from Richard Van Wagner's article on Sarah Pratt. It's titled The Shaping of an Apostate. It's a really interesting article. I'd recommend you check it out. You'll find it in the show notes. Quote, After a three-day honeymoon, Orson resumed his missionary duties, leaving Sarah with her family. He returned to Henderson several times before October when he and Sarah moved to a dollar-a-month apartment in Kirtland, Ohio. Orson began trading in stoves and ironware, but a general downturn in the national economy, coupled with Kirtland's spiraling land speculation and the fiscal mismanagement of the Kirtland Safety Society, destroyed the economic foundation of the Mormon utopia. The couple had a few financial resources when Sarah gave birth on 11th July 1837 to Orson Pratt Jr., the first of her 12 children. In mid-August, when she and the baby were able to travel, the young family moved back to the Bates homestead in New York, where Orson worked as a laborer for two months. End quote. After that, the Pratt couple briefly moved to New York City as Orson Brain Power Pratt fulfilled various mission duties. Now, remember from so many moons ago, we gave Orson Pratt the nickname of Orson Brain Power Pratt because he was renowned for his science lectures, and he invented the tachometer with a clever set of cogs on a wagon wheel during the exodus to the Mexico Territory. Orson and Sarah began their journey to the Missouri settlement of Far West at the behest of Joe's July revelation requiring all Mormons to move to the new settlement sanctuary in Missouri, 1838. However, due to holdups in traveling and Sarah's second pregnancy, they didn't make it before Missouri exploded and the Mormons were chased out while the leadership was thrown into jails. The Pratts made their way from St. Louis to Quincy, Illinois after spring 1839 began thawing the ground and the Mississippi River. They had three-month-old Lydia Pratt in their arms for the journey. But that was only the beginning of their troubles. Continuing from Richard Van Wagner, quote, by mid-May 1839, they were living in a small log cabin with the Wilford Woodruff family at abandoned Fort Des Moines in Montrose, Iowa. Two months later, they moved across the Mississippi to live in a 14-by-16-foot shanty that Heber C. Kimball had nearly completed in Nauvoo. The brackish waters of the undrained river-bottom lands surrounding Nauvoo produced epidemics of cholera, typhoid, and malaria. Sarah's eight-month-old baby Lydia, the first of six of her twelve children who would not attain adulthood, died 18th August 1839 and was buried across the Mississippi at Montrose. Eleven days later, grief-stricken Sarah bade Europe-bound Orson goodbye, an act she would perform many times as he fulfilled his missionary callings. End quote. It was during this time of destitution that Orson Pratt began his journey to Europe to accompany the other eight men of the Quorum of Apostles to establish the European stakes of the church and, of course, begin the Perpetual Immigration Fund. Sarah was left behind. Van Wagner quotes Sarah directly from her 1884 reminiscence of this time, quote, There was little money then in circulation, and people were obliged to be content to earn what would merely keep soul and body together. He goes on to note when Joe and Sarah began close proximity, and this is when they likely would have become familiar enough for Joe to have become comfortable propositioning her to become one of his wives. Joseph Smith had been hiring Sarah for his own family's sewing needs, and in the fall of 1840, he brought John C. Bennett, a newcomer to Mormonism, to Sarah's house, saying Bennett, quote, wanted some sewing done and that Sarah should do it for him. Sarah said that she, quote, assented and Bennett gave me a great deal of work to do. Bennett would play a major role in the controversy that would follow Sarah Pratt all her life, end quote. Sarah Pratt, and the reason why we're focusing on her today, was among the few women who found their voice to publicly oppose the advances of Joe and other Mormon elites. Miss Nancy Rigdon was another notable obstructionist to Joe's advances, and of course Martha Brotherton was the most publicly opposed to Bloody Brigham's advances. Sarah Pratt is yet one more woman in Mormon history who's been thrown under the bus because of standing up to sexual predators. 
Mormon history is rife with these women throughout its entire history, but these women stand out as examples in Nauvoo who stood up for their beliefs and sexual autonomy, not giving in to the powerful men in the Mormon hierarchy. And we'll learn by the end of today's episode that they suffered horrible consequences for opposing the sexual advances of Mormon elites. Sarah Pratt, in particular, is one who had been resoundingly derided in Mormon history, and it's incredibly frustrating to read how her name has been weaponized by people with so much to lose if rumors became facts. Bennett collected her statement and published it in his History of the Saints, which was the compilation of all of his expose letters in the Sangamo Journal. Patrons of the show, of course, are hearing it all firsthand with my commentary, patreon.com slash Mormonism, folks. Here's Bennett's sketch of Sarah Pratt, along with some of her own words as a testimony with a brief intro. Quote, Amours and attempted seductions. Mrs. Sarah M. Pratt. This lady is the wife of Orson, brain power, Pratt, A.M. professor of mathematics in the University of the City of Nauvoo, and is one of the most elegant, graceful, amiable, and accomplished women in the place. Mr. S. Francis, editor of the Singamo Journal, in speaking of her, says, It will be recollected that Mrs. Schindel, in her affidavit detailing the attempt of Smith upon her, said, He then told her that she must never tell of his proposition to her, for he had all influence in that place. And if she told, he would ruin her character, and she would be under the necessity of leaving. This same scheme has been carried out in reference to Mrs. Pratt. She told on the impostor and was marked by him for destruction. In a public speech in Nauvoo on the 14th July, Joe spoke of this lady, a woman whose reputation had been as fair as virtue could make it until she came into contact with him, in a manner only befitting the lowest and most degraded vagabond in existence. Yes, her reputation was unsullied, and her character as pure as the virgin snow, nor was even the Mormon Don Juan able to blight this blooming flower. This noble and lovely woman was marked out by Joe as a victim. Her husband was sent to Europe to convert the heathen under a solemn promise that his family should be honorably provided for by the church. But, as Mrs. Pratt was a beautiful and charming woman, Joe's real object was to convert her in another way. From virtue, unsophisticated virtue, to vice, soul-damning vice. From the path of innocence and peace to the polluted way of the libertine. From the pure teachings of heaven's high king to the loathsome caresses of the beast and the false prophet. But the fowler's snare was broken and the intended victim saved. Bennett then goes on to describe the alleged coercive measures that Joe employed here. Now, should these be true? Um, well, it it paints a picture of Joseph Smith as a degraded and immoral profligate. Just understand that this is not the only account of allegations like this concerning Joseph Smith. To the contrary, allegations of his sexual misdeeds must be ignored to sell the narrative that he was a conscientious objector to polygamy and only begrudgingly assented at the behest of an angel with a drawn sword. Quote, Mrs. Pratt is a highly educated lady and had always been used to living well, but no sooner had her husband crossed the ocean than Joe ordered the bishop to restrict her in her allowance and reduce her to a state of absolute want and suffering in order to make her a more easy prey. The mandate was obeyed, and in dreary winter, without fuel or food, she found herself in a miserable hovel with her darling child exposed to storm and tempest, and dependent upon the tender mercies of a cold and unfeeling fraternity to supply her actual wants. The sufferings and privations through which she passed are indescribable. The blackest fiends of hell would shudder at the thought of such inhuman treatment, but alas, she drank the bitter cup and sipped the dregs. End quote. According to Bennett in this expose, and, you know, any statement that begins with the, that phrase, according to Bennett, has a mess of conflicts already built into it. But regardless of those conflicts, according to Bennett, after Joe supposedly promised Orson Pratt that Sarah would be taken care of by the church during his Europe mission, he provided briefly for her upon Orson's departure, then began deliberately starving her. Uh, quote, in order to make her a more easy prey. Now, 
that's a step pretty far, okay? And it casts this entire account into question because most of the Mormons were wanting for resources at this time, and Joe wasn't known for keeping promises. What's more likely is Sarah probably slipped through the cracks, just like thousands of other starving Mormons. The result, however, was the same. Sarah found herself in a situation at the age of 25 where her husband was in a foreign country. She had only her New York education and the skillful vocation as a seamstress to provide for herself and her toddler. The Nauvoo Legion and the Mormons' abrupt removal from Missouri necessitated a lot of manufacturing and mercantile work. Her status in Nauvoo was the wife of an apostle, but most of the Mormons were still quite poor in 1842. That and Orson was in Europe preaching the gospel, and that didn't do their family economy any favors. So Sarah must have been a skillful and intelligent woman out of necessity, and she made ends meet when funds from the church inevitably dried up for her as they did for thousands of other Mormons. The Relief Society was for the relief of the Mormons' poverty, that's why it was created. Now it remains unknown exactly when the events about to be described transpired. Sometime before Orson Brainpower Pratt returned in June of 1841, according to Rekka Bennett, Joe decided to approach Sarah. And I say approach in air quotes. Here's how the events took place according to Bennett as an incredibly biased first-person account. It's from the History of the Saints, picking up where we left off, beginning on page 228. Quote, Joe Smith told me, confidentially, during the absence of her husband, that he intended to make Mrs. Pratt one of his spiritual wives, one of the cloistered saints, for the Lord had given her to him as a special favor for his faithfulness and zeal. And, as I had influence with her, he desired me to assist him in the consummation of his hellish purposes. But I refused compliance." and told him that she had been much neglected and abused by the church in order to cloister her so far without success, and that, if the Lord had given her to him, he must attend to it himself, for I should never offer her an indignity. End quote. Yeah, Bennett, such a stand-up guy, right, in telling Joe to go pound sand when he was told of Joe's intentions with Sarah. Now, I want to just say this is a pretty common theme underlying many Mormon infiltration exposés like this. The person writing the exposé is careful to exonerate themselves from any guilt in anything that they reveal, even to the detriment of the reliability of the exposé itself. Such may be the case with Bennett. He had influence with her? Was he simply a good friend because Sarah was one of the many needed seamstresses for Nauvoo Legion, or... Was there something more to it? Joe would leverage Sarah and Bennett's friendship, whatever that friendship was, we can't know, in order to assassinate Sarah's character once Bennett's expose went public. According to Bennett, Joe made it very clear how he would deal with Sarah if she refused. Quote, Well, said he, I shall approach her, for there is no harm in it if she submits to be cloistered and if her husband should never find out. And if she should expose me as she did Bishop Knight, I will blast her character. So there is no material risk for so desirable a person. End quote. Then something happened that supposedly happened with Nancy Rigton. Bennett warned Sarah ahead of time of Joe's wicked designs, or hellish designs, I think as Bennett put it. He apparently told Sarah that she, quote, must prepare to repulse him in so infamous an assault on her virtue, end quote. So according to Bennett, the big day came for Joe, and he wanted to take Sarah Pratt to wife. They took a carriage to her home. This is Bennett and Joe, and that is where Sarah and little Orson Jr. were. And here's what's, what supposedly transpired, but once again, this is all according to Reckett Bennett, so take it with an entire mine worth of salt, not just a grain. Quote, Accordingly, in a few days, Joe proposed to me a visit to Ramus, which I accepted, and we started from his house in an open carriage, rode into the prairie a few miles, and returned to the house of Captain John T. Barnett in Nauvoo about dusk, where we put up the horse with Barnett's permission. Joe pretended we were looking for thieves. After perambulating for an hour or two, we proceeded to the residence of Mrs. Pratt, and found her at home, and alone with the exception of her little boy, who was then asleep in the bed. 
We were hospitably received, and our situation rendered as comfortable and as agreeable as the tenement would admit of. End quote. The big moment had arrived. Joe said it himself If she refuses, what's the harm in it? He'll just blast her character, and he's the prophet, so he holds a little bit more sway than a poor woman living outside the boundaries of Nauvoo with no income beyond a seamstress work. And just a little bit of qualifying words here, a common 19th century euphemism for uh, sex work was a seamstress. This is from the Encyclopedia of Prostitution and Sex Works, Volume 2, circa 2006, written by clinical sociologist and behavioral scientist Melissa Dittmore. Quote, Seamstress was a euphemism for prostitute in census records and other documents of the 19th century in the United States. Historical documentation showing several seamstresses sharing common living quarters may generally be assumed to represent a brothel. Whether this occupation was reported by prostitutes or supplied by census enumerators and other officials remains speculative, although potential reasons for both are easily understood. Legitimate uses of the term should not be confused with the codified use. Other historical and modern euphemisms exist, including laundresses and actresses." End quote. Now, hey, Seattle was built almost exclusively by heavily taxing, quote-unquote, seamstresses. It's the world's oldest profession, and it's an important piece to American and world history that we can never forget to include the impact of. Maybe Sarah had provided all the sewing work that Joe required of her, and she was given to Bennett to be his personal seamstress. That's what it said earlier from, you know, Richard Van Wagner using documentation from the time. But I want, want us to take a step back here, because nothing of what I've said should be disparaging to the profession of sex work. Consider Sarah's place in society at this time. She was a woman living in destitution and barely able to provide for herself and her toddler. Her husband was absent, and she made her living as a seamstress. Now, regardless of whether or not she engaged in sex work, I don't think that's an important point to discuss. It was really easy to brand the testimony of a quote-unquote seamstress as unreliable in the court of public opinion, especially when that branding was orchestrated by the prophet of Mormonism, mayor of Nauvoo, and lieutenant general of the Nauvoo Legion, all funneled together into one demagogue of a deplorable human being. Do you think that people took Sarah's word over Joe's word? Would somebody trust the word of a publicly smeared prostitute against the word of God? How many women did Joe put in similar situations that he did with Sarah Pratt? What kind of documentary evidence would we expect to find of this? These encounters wouldn't be documented whatsoever if not for people like Bennett. Bennett gave these women credible voice. Historians would never have evidence for conduct like this in Nauvoo Mormonism without people who actually published letters written by women in Nauvoo attached to a credible government official's name. You can already see the systemic power dynamic putting Sarah at a disadvantage here. It was her word against the word of God. As soon as Sarah was marked by Joe, there was no way out of what would happen. She could refuse his advances and draw the ire of the Almighty Joe, or she could go along with it, as dozens or possibly hundreds of women did, and just keep her mouth shut. No doubt, there are some people who engaged in polygamy 100% willingly in Nauvoo, while completely informed and consenting and understanding all of the complications with it, but we need to understand the coercive forces at play here. The content and context of Joe's proposition to Sarah is quite revealing of exactly what I'm talking about here. Continuing from History of the Saints, quote, After considerable desultory conversation, Joe asked her if she would keep a secret for him, to which she assented. Do you pledge me your honor, said he, that you will never tell without my permission? She replied in the affirmative. He then continued, Sarah Pratt, the Lord has given you to me as one of my spiritual wives. I have the blessings of Jacob granted me as God granted holy men of old. And as I have long looked upon you with favor and an earnest desire of connubial bliss, I hope you will not repulse or deny me. 
according to Bennett, she knew this was coming. You know, uh, uh, apparently Bennett had warned her ahead of time, just like with Nancy Rigdon. But now it was out there. The proposition was out there and nobody in the room could go back. Also consider Sarah was probably living off some provisions in the Bishop's storehouse in order to supplement her meager income from seamstress work regardless of what phrasing or whether that's the legitimate seamstress or the codified term. If she happened to refuse the prophet's advances, could she expect those provisions to keep coming in? I mean, it was only her livelihood at stake. It was only her entire public persona. I mean, there's a lot of coercion that's playing into this interaction in ways we can't possibly imagine. Now, here's Sarah's reply, making her sound more like the conventional definition of seamstress instead of the euphemistic definition as introduced earlier. Quote, And is that the great secret that I am not to utter? Am I called upon to break the marriage covenant and prove recreant to my lawful husband? I never will. My sex shall not be disgraced, nor my honor sullied. I care not for the blessings of Jacob, and I believe in no such revelations. Neither will I consent under any circumstances whatever. I have one good husband, and that is enough for me. And that was apparently the end of the transaction. Joe and Bennett left, likely after a bit more, you know, stubborn persuasion and coercion was lost. Bennett spent the night at... John T. Barnett's house while Joe spent the night with Louisa Beeman, and, you know, he probably got his rocks off there. Like I said, sure, there may have been some willing participants in polygamy, but this interaction between Sarah and Joe shows Joseph Smith in a light that doesn't have any holy veneer whatsoever. It's quite disturbing. Apparently, Bennett followed up with Sarah Pratt after this encounter. Quote, Next day we returned to Nauvoo. I then called upon Mrs. Pratt and asked her if her opinion of Joseph Smith the prophet was the same as heretofore. She replied, No, he is a bad man, beyond a doubt, wicked, sensual, devilish. But it will not do for me to express myself openly, or my life might atone for it. It becomes me to move in this matter with much circumspection. I must be as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. For I see plainly that Joseph is determined to transgress the laws, change the ordinance, and break the everlasting covenant of our Heavenly Father, and to set at open defiance every principle of true godliness and moral rectitude. I exceedingly fear and tremble for the weak and uneducated of my sex, for an unprincipled libertine, sensualist, and debauchee of such unbounded prophetic influence in a community like this— may utterly ruin hundreds of pious, unsuspecting females under the potent dictum of a thus saith the Lord, and all the proof they would require would be his simple ipsy dixit. Oh, what total depravity, what ignorance and impudence in a land of Bibles where Christians ought to dwell and worship the great ruler of the universe in the beauty of holiness. Surely God will not suffer it long. I had a better opinion of human nature, but alas, I was deceived. The scales, however, have fallen from my eyes, and whereas I was once blind, now I see. I am in a great trouble on another account. My husband is a good and pious man and a true believer in Mormonism, devotedly attached to Joseph as the spiritual leader of the church. He believes him to be a pure man and a prophet of the Lord. Now, if I should tell him the true story of my sufferings, privations, and insults, and Joseph should circumvent or meet it with his infallible rebuff of a verily thus saith the Lord, I fear that Orson would believe him in preference to me, unless his faith can be shaken. How shall I extricate myself from this fearful dilemma? End quote. Now, just to let you know, I did cut a little bit out of her reply to Bennett after he went and spoke with her, merely for the sake of brevity and holding off discussing another subject that's attached to Bennett that may come up in the future when, you know, trying to find Book of Mormon plates. It's a whole other issue. But the crux of Sarah Pratt's complaints is that Joe put her in a situation that she can't seem to find a way out of. She was marked as a victim of Joe, 
and she couldn't agree and stay silent or oppose and have her character slain in the public forum. She was coerced into a situation, and her husband, likely the only person who could defend her against the prophet, was in another country at this time. She could refuse Joe's advances, remain silent about it, but it was only a matter of time before that silence was broken by John C. Reckett Bennett in his expose. Thing is, is Bennett kind of threw her name out there, likely without her knowledge or prior consent, and then used it as a weapon against the tyrant Joe Smith. Her name has been weaponized ever since. Now, according to Bennett, Sarah petitioned him for advice as a close friend, and Bennett's reply is, quote, Be quiet, Sarah, under these circumstances, until some event transpires by which Orson can have ocular and oracular demonstration of the palpable imposture of the whole scheme of Mormonism and the infidelity and brutality of the Mormon mountebank. And such an event must soon be consummated unless there should be manifest change in the Mormon's administration. End quote. Bennett goes on to claim, quote, Joe afterwards tried to convince Mrs. Pratt of the propriety of his spiritual wife doctrine, and she at last told him peremptorily, Joseph, if you ever attempt anything of the kind with me again, I will make a full disclosure to Mr. Pratt on his return home. Depend upon it. I will certainly do it. Joe replied, Sister Pratt, I hope you will not expose me, for if I suffer, all must suffer. So do not expose me. Will you promise me that you will not do it? If, she said, you will never insult me again, I will not expose you, unless strong circumstances should require it. If you should tell, said he, I will ruin your reputation. Remember that. And as you have repulsed me, it becomes sin unless sacrifice is offered. End quote. And then it goes on to detail a lamb being literally slaughtered in sacrifice so that the destroying angel passes over the Pratt home. Sarah Pratt wouldn't become food for the Mississippi catfish, even though she refused the advances of the prophet. Quote, Mrs. Pratt, in a conversation with Mrs. Goddard, observed, Sister Goddard, Joseph is a corrupt man. I know it, for he made an attempt upon me in the name of the Lord. I now detest the man. But Joe apparently wasn't done with Sarah. The thing is, he never relented on his goals. Sarah was marked, and he wasn't one to give up on those personal goals. From History of the Saints, quote, Time passed on without further molestation until one day after Mr. Pratt's return from Europe, Joe called at her new house and grossly insulted her again by stealthily approaching her and kissing her. <laughs> How funny boys will be boys, won't they? <laughs> this highly offended her, and she told her husband, Colonel Orson Pratt, who was highly incensed and gave Joe a severe rebuke. Joe observed, I did not desire to kiss her. Bennett made me do it. Joe couldn't come to the extreme unction over that intelligent lady. She was far above his polluted breath, his ribaldry, low vituperation, calumny, and detraction. He lied to her in the name of Israel's God. Let the base blasphemer remember that and weep. If Joe Smith is not destined for the devil, all I can say is that the duties of the devil have not been clearly understood. End quote. Bennett made me do it. He kissed her unconsensually, and he said, Bennett made me do it when Orson Pratt raised a stink. Does Joe's rascality know no bounds? I mean, here we can see Sarah Pratt and her sexuality being weaponized by high-ranking men in the church who clearly didn't care about her reputation or personal well-being above their own. Bennett's expose revealed what had been going on with Sarah Pratt in a way that was shocking to a lot of people. It was also reported that Bennett's friendship with Sarah was more than just friendship, which threw her character further into question. Sarah Pratt was now the talk of Nauvoo, and rumors are absolutely merciless. As a result of this information coming to light, 
and Joe stealthily, quote unquote, kissing Sarah here and all of the newly circulating rumors concerning Sarah Pratt. Joseph Smith's journal entry for July 15th, 1842, reveals how some of this conflict was impacting other prominent figures in Nauvoo leadership. Quote, Friday the 15th, this a.m., early a report was in circulation that Orson Pratt was missing. A letter of his writing was found directed to his wife, stating to the effect that he was going away. Soon as this was known, Joseph summoned the principal men of the city and workmen on the temple to meet at the temple grove, where he ordered them to proceed immediately throughout the city in search of him, lest he should have laid violent hands upon himself. End quote. The next day's issue of the Warsaw Signal revealed that it was generally understood in Nauvoo at this time that Orson Pratt was in a mental state that he was a danger to himself. Warsaw Signal, quote, We understand by the stage driver from Nauvoo last evening that O. Pratt has suddenly disappeared from the city. He left a paper containing his reasons for leaving, which were the treatment his wife had received from Joe Smith and some other manner concerning the policy of the church, polygamy. It was supposed in Nauvoo that he had committed suicide, and about 500 persons were out on the search for him. End quote. The initial search didn't turn Orson Pratt up. He eventually wandered back into town the next day, and he just needed a small respite to let things blow over, apparently. However, Orson Brain Power Pratt's unknown whereabouts didn't stop Joe from using this opportunity to further vilify Bennett, his enemy, his arch rival at this time, obviously never acknowledging his own role in causing this meltdown. After the day of searching, the brethren gathered in the grove near the temple that was nearing a full floor in its construction process. This is the substance of the sermon that Joe gave. Literally, while Orson Pratt was assumed dead by his own hand, because of the splash damage caused by clandestine spiritual wifery by Joseph Smith. Quote, After considerable search had been made, but to no effect, a meeting was called at the Grove where Joseph stated before the public a general outline of John C. Bennett's conduct, and especially with regard to sister Sarah Bates Pratt. Met again in the p.m. when Hiram Smith, Heber C. Kimball, spake on the same subject, after which Joseph arose and said that he would state to those present some things which he had heard respecting Edward and David Kilborn being conspiring with John C. Bennett in endeavoring to bring a mob upon us. Everybody's our enemy, never acknowledging his own role. And as Mr. E. Kilborn was then present, he would have the privilege of either admitting or denying it. Question by E. Kilborn. Who did Bennett tell that I and my brother were conspiring to bring a mob upon you? Answer by Joseph. He told me and he told blank Allred and Orson Pratt's wife and others. Question by E. Kilborn. A nice little back and forth between Kilborn and, and Joe here. Where did he say we were going to bring a mob from? Answer by Joseph. From Galena. Mr. Kilborn then arose and said, I was conversing with my brother this morning, and he said he had never seen Bennett since he had us before him last year for a conspiracy. I have only seen him twice since last fall. I saw him once then. I was going to Galena about two weeks ago. The boat I was on stopped at the upper landing place, and I came ashore a little while. The first person I saw was Bennett. We entered into conversation, but there was no mention made of mobs. I have not seen him since. I always regarded Bennett the same as I regard you, Joseph, and thought you were pretty well matched. If anyone says that I have conspired to bring a mob upon you, it is false. The meeting was then peaceably dismissed. O.P. returned at night. He was seen about two miles this side of Warsaw, set on a log. He says he has concluded to do right. End quote. There's a lot going on in Nauvoo. I mean, the rumors of conspiracy at the hand of Bennett in league with a number of other Nauvoo elites infected the minds of the initiated elite. Was Bennett working with others to bring a mob into town and put down the whole Mormon problem? Who was working with Bennett? Would Bennett align with Missouri officials and effect an arrest of Joe and other elites, extradite them to Missouri and force them to answer on the old Missouri charges resulting in all of their deaths? I mean, a lot of unknowns floated about Nauvoo. Joe continued to conduct business as business necessitated. 
He went about the next few days dealing with buying and selling property, looking at a land to hew timber for more construction projects being added to the waiting list. And then on July 22nd, 1842, Orson Pratt briefly got access to Joe on the pulpit, and a confrontation ensued. Quote, At the stand, conflicting with Orson Pratt and correcting the public mind with regard to reports put in circulation by Bennett and others, in the PM, a petition was prepared and signed by the citizens praying the government not issue a writ for the president. Now, this is what led to the confrontation. And I'm pulling this from the History of the Church. This is the Vogel edition, volume 5, page 68. It was a vote swearing to the good character of Joseph Smith, to which Orson Pratt voted in the negative, which led to the conflict between him and Joe up on the stand. Quote, Resolved that having heard that John C. Bennett was circulating many base falsehoods respecting a number of the citizens of Nauvoo, and especially against our worthy and respected mayor, Joseph Smith, we do hereby manifest to the world that so far as we are acquainted with Joseph Smith, we know him to be a good, moral, virtuous, peaceable, and patriotic man, and a coach of a girls' basketball team, and a firm supporter of law, justice, and equal rights. And he at all times upholds and keeps inviolate the constitution of this state, probably doesn't vote, and of the United States, which resolution was adopted by numerous assembly. Now, the next section that I'm about to read was actually cut from the B.H. Roberts version of the history of the church, but Dan Vogel, being the amazing historian that he is, has painstakingly reconstructed the history of the church from the original sources, which reveals details of the conflict between Orson Brainpower Pratt and Joe concerning this resolution. So all of this that I'm about to read is ta- it was actually removed from the Roberts history of the church. Quote, Two or three voted in the negative in response to the petition I just read. Elder Orson Pratt then rose and spoke at some length in explanation of his negative vote. President Joseph Smith spoke in reply. Question to Elder Pratt. Have you personally a knowledge of any immoral act in me toward the female sex or in any other way? Answer by Elder O. Pratt. Personally toward the female sex, I have not. Elder O. Pratt responded at some length. Elder B. Young then spoke in reply and was followed by Elders William Law, Heber C. Kimball, and President Hiram Smith. Several others spoke bearing the testimony of the iniquity of those who had calumniated President Joseph Smith's character. Meeting adjourned for one hour. And now the next line is where the B.H. Roberts History of the Church picks back up. This is what was not cut from the history. The assembly came together in the forenoon, and about 800 signed the foregoing petition presented by the city council to Governor Carlin. End quote. Now, let's just tease apart the historicity of the, the history of the church here. The way this was initially recorded can't be trusted, right? This was recorded by Willard Richards at the time, and possibly William Clayton, I'm not sure, actually. And... We can understand that their recounting of the conflict between Orson Pratt and Joseph Smith up on the stand was a bit biased to begin with. And then Roberts even proceeded to remove that little tiny bit about their conflict completely away from the history of the church when he compiled it in the early 1900s. Transparency versus whitewashing or hiding history happens in degrees, people. It's not binary. Regardless, it is a bit revealing when we go to the actual source text. So that petition was drafted, indeed, pleading Governor Carlin to not issue a writ of arrest to Joseph Smith. Before getting to that, I also actually, you know, I want to briefly mention something that happened that kind of slipped my gaze back in late June of 1842. So this is just, you know, a month before where we're talking about. This is from the Vogel History of the Church, volume 5, page 45, quote, My clerk, Willard Richards, being about to leave me for a season, committed the business of my office to Elder William Clayton, who had been engaged with him for a few weeks past, end quote. William Clayton's appointment to being Joe's personal clerk will figure heavily into the rest of Joe's life and ministry for the two years that remain. That was just a brief point to mention, and my apologies for missing that important point of Mormon history. It just slipped past my notice. So the petition that I read earlier was drafted, and a number of men signed their own affidavits concerning the conduct of John C. Reckett Bennett. Now, the primary petition to Governor Carlin reads in part, quote, 
Concerning those statements made by Bennett against Joseph Smith, we know that they are false. Joseph Smith has our entire confidence. We know that he has violated no law, nor has he in any wise promoted sedition or rebellion against the Union, of course. Nor has he sought the injury of any citizen of this or any other place. He's just a perfect stand-up guy. We are perfectly assured that he is as loyal, patriotic, and virtuous a man as there is in the state of Illinois, and we appeal to your excellency if, in three years' acquaintance with him, you have seen anything to the contrary. (laughs) Anything to the contrary? Lilbert Boggs was still recovering from being shot, and Governor Carlin had a writ of extradition sitting on his desk from Boggs to arrest Joe and Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell. Carlin had right to be afraid that the Mormons might rise up against his rule as governor, as had happened with Missouri with Governor Boggs in 1838. How would that look to Carlin's political career? open rebellion and sedition in his state? Would he even survive for re-election in 1842 should the Mormons rise up that year, or would they assassinate him as apparently they had Governor Boggs? There were a lot of rumors roaming around that Joseph had sworn out, you know, old Pistol Pack and Porter, to have a little visit with Governor Carlin. I mean, a lot of scary questions weighed on Governor Carlin's mind at this time. Now, the end of this petition, and it's apparently signed by 800 Navajo Mormons, said the following, quote, Having heard a report that your excellency had called upon several companies of militia to prepare themselves and be in readiness in case of emergency, we would further ask of your excellency that if the state or country should be in danger, that the Navu Legion may have the privilege of showing their loyalty in defense thereof, end quote. Let's just tease that apart for a second. If they're going to raise up a militia, if Governor Carlin is going to call the state of Illinois militia to put down the Mormon rebellion, now Joe is offering the Nauvoo Legion to Governor Carlin? Should he call out the militia? It's a lot harder to raise up a militia to fight the Mormons and arrest Joe Smith when half of that militia is the Nauvoo Legion beholden to Joseph Smith above any secular rule of law. He was the mouthpiece of God. The petition concludes with this, quote, We have the fullest confidence in the honor, justice, and integrity of your excellency, and feel confidence that we have only to present our case before you to ensure protection, believing that the cries of so many peaceable and patriotic citizens will not be disregarded by your excellency. We therefore ask you as the chief magistrate of this state to grant us our requests, and we, as in duty bound, will ever pray." And it was signed by 800 citizens and the entire Mormon Nauvoo elite, except for Orson Pratt. Now, the Mormons didn't just send that single petition to Governor Carlin. It included affidavits from Daniel H. Wells, Hiram Smith, George Miller, Elias and Francis Higby, William Law, and a substantial article that was published in the Times and Seasons about John C. Bennett, which sought solely to completely assassinate his credibility. It was whacking at a wildfire with a blanket. None of these affidavits actually stopped the Bennett meltdown from melting down. It was purely damage control. Each affidavit sought to refute each of Bennett's claims, but the collective weight of Bennett's expose and the unstoppable force of all of the rumors which had been slowly infecting Nauvoo was just too much for these affidavits to abate. They were all published in the Times and Seasons. Now, the Hiram Smith affidavit is possibly the most fascinating of the bunch. I've read the substance of it before on this show, but never within the context of this Bennett meltdown. This is where Hiram's sidekick Abiff Smith claimed that Bennett had medicine to produce an abortion should pregnancy result from the practice of spiritual wifery, because of course that was a common result. Smith's, uh, Hiram Smith's affidavit also claimed Bennett had told a woman that he wanted to acquire her as a spiritual wife, that he'd be happy to poison her husband if she consented in order to put him out of the way. According to Hiram Smith, Bennett attempted to poison the man, 
but the man wouldn't take the quote-unquote medicine, which would result in his death. So Bennett was therefore unsuccessful in taking this woman as a wife. Now, years later, Sarah Pratt corroborated the substantive portion of Hiram Smith's abortion claim when she was interviewed by Wilhelm Ritter von Weimetal in his expose of 1886. She was then residing in Utah as an apostate. Quote, Mrs. P., you will hear often that Joseph had no polygamous offspring. The reason for this is very simple. Abortion was practiced on a large scale in Nauvoo. Dr. John C. Bennett, the evil genius of Joseph, brought this abomination into a scientific system. He showed to my husband and me the instruments with which he sued to operate for Joseph. Quote, that's, in, that's in air quotes, operate for Joseph. There was a house in Nauvoo right across the flat, about a mile and a half from the town, a kind of hospital. They sent the women there when they showed signs of celestial consequences. Abortion was practiced regularly in this house. Then it goes on to say, Mrs. H, many little bodies of newborn children floated down the Mississippi. End quote. That Mrs. H is Lucinda Morgan Harris, the widow of William Morgan, who was likely killed in 1826 because he published his expose of masonry. Joe had apparently taken Harris to wife while in Nauvoo, possibly even in Missouri. When Sarah Pratt confronted Lucinda Harris about Joe's spiritual wife system, Lucinda said, quote, How foolish you are. I don't see anything so horrible in it. Why, I am his mistress since four years. End quote. Like I said, there may have been some willing and informed consenting participants in polygamy, but the vast majority of them were completely uninformed and the coercive measures completely destroy any veneer of consent in all of this. Sarah Pratt continued in Nauvoo as a pariah. The Wasp joined the Times and Seasons in publishing affidavits supposedly disproving the claims of Bennett. Eventually, Stephen and Zariah Goddard who were friends of the Pratts, very good friends with Sarah Pratt. They provided a lot of financial and emotional support while Orson Pratt was on his mission. Apparently, the Goddards were co coerced into signing an affidavit that was published in The Wasp, directed to Orson Pratt, that linked Bennett and Sarah Pratt's relationship as being more than just friends. Here it is out of The Wasp. Quote, one night, they took their chairs out of doors and remained there, we supposed, until 12 o'clock or after. At another time, they went over to the house where you now live and came back after dark or about that time. We went over several times late in the evening while she lived in the house of Dr. Foster and were most sure to find Dr. Bennett and your wife together, as it were, man and wife. End quote. So, the Goddards signed this affidavit that not only implied but explicitly stated that Bennett and Sarah Pratt were having an affair. Sarah confronted the Goddards about this statement, but this was found in Y. Metal's 1886 expose. That's decades after this was published in The Wasp. Quote, in his endeavors to ruin my character, Joseph went so far to publish an extra sheet containing affidavits against my reputation, when this sheet was brought to me, I discovered to my astonishment the names of two people on it, man and wife, with whom I had boarded for a certain time. I went to their house. The man left the house hurriedly when he saw me coming. I found the wife and said to her rather excitedly, What does this all mean? She began to sob. It's not my fault, said she. Hiram Smith came to our house with the affidavits all written out and forced us to sign them. Joseph and the church must be saved, said he. We saw that resistance was useless, and they would have ruined us, so we signed the papers. End quote. When I look at Sarah Pratt, I don't see an angry apostate. I see a woman who stood up to a patriarchal system and was caught up in the cogs of the mighty protectionist machine and spit out with her character and reputation forever destroyed. Read what fair Mormon has to say about her. The character assassination has been effective even 130 years after her death. Quote, 
When the Bennett imbriglio blew up a year later, Joseph may have been reluctant to publicly try Sarah. If he had proposed a plural marriage to her, the revelations that a hostile adulteress could make would be disastrous. Adulteress? Really? The rest of this article is consistently unkind to Sarah Pratt's allegations and completely washes away the allegations of Bennett's abortion practices. MormonPolygamyDocuments.org, that's Brian Hill's brain dump website, says this about Sarah Pratt after reprinting her statement about the abortion house. Quote, Sarah claimed many things about Joseph Smith throughout her lifetime, but this is probably one of her most over-the-top statements concerning the abortions. She made other allegations that contradict more reliable historical data. For example, when asked about the statement, Joseph had 80 wives at the time of his death, Sarah Pratt replied, He had many more, my dear sir. At least he had seduced many more. And those with whom he had lived without their being sealed to him were sealed to him after his death. Currently, there is no evidence for 80 wives or many more than 80, as Pratt alleged. End quote. This entire article is precisely indicative of why so many people are quickly frustrated with Brian Hale's scholarship. It's presentist to claim that there's no evidence for Joe having more than 80 wives because the lines between celestially sealed wife versus spiritual wife versus mistress in 1842 weren't clear. It's only later scholarship that has postulated the documentable 33-something wives of Joseph Smith, but when these relationships were happening in real time in Nauvoo, so few were actually documented as having been sealed to Joe, and all of his little one-night stands simply can never be substantiated with documentation because they were never initially recorded. Look, a powerful and wealthy guy of Joe's temperament has relations with a lot of women and actively seeks to cover them up. What documentation would historians expect to find to prove that these relationships happen to any degree? Oh, Joseph Smith, he, he begrudgingly practiced celestial marriage only after being threatened by an angel with a drawn sword. He never wanted to marry 33 women. It was purely out of religious obligation. Sure, you know, the documentation exists to support those conclusions, but those documents are viewed through a presentist lens in a way to exonerate the holy and pious prophet of any wrongdoing or accusations of adultery, or worse, coercion and sexual abuse. The facts of the matter are that Joe slept with a lot of women. Multiple independent credible records exist claiming that Bennett performed abortions to conceal the inevitable result, and documentation never existed in the first place concerning the scope and reach of all of his sexual escapades. Joe tried to apply a holy veneer to his nefarious conduct at the time, and historians ever since have been towing that same party line. The real-world impact of his concerted efforts to conceal his adulterous practices is revealed when we consider Sarah Pratt and her public character when she opposed Joe and ventured to speak out in opposition to reveal what was going on. She pitied the women who weren't as educated or as strong as her. Maybe she thought that if I speak up, that somebody who is weaker than me will be spared. The statements she made weren't done proactively. They were done because her name was weaponized by people who likely didn't care about her or her well-being, and she was forced to make public statements to clarify what happened. She made the statements, and the assassination of her character is all that remains in the collective memory of Mormon history. To illustrate that point, consider the way the rest of Hale's article concerning Bennett, Pratt, and abortions flippantly dismisses her multiple statements. It concludes with, with postulating an inaccurate date of 1843 instead of 1842 for Bennett's signed statement that Joe never taught Bennett about plural marriage. But you'll recall that statement was explicitly made under duress, according to Bennett. Then Brian Hills goes on to say this, quote, 
Of less important to critics, but of great significance to Nauvoo polygamists, is that Joseph taught that plural marriage was to, quote, multiply and replenish the earth, end quote. Now, that cites Doctrine and Covenants section 132. That was from one year after the Bennett meltdown happened, and it was used to justify what was going on. He goes on to say, Abortion produces the opposite result. The duplicity, if it had ever occurred, not only would have created confusion among his morally conservative followers, but also would have branded him a hypocrite. No such allegations are found in the historical record. Yes, because the, any documentation that may have been created was suppressed at the time and never would have survived the century and a half of archivists, even if such documents were ever made in the first place. And to dismiss it so flippantly, the duplicity, if it had ever occurred, would not only have created confusion, that implies that most Mormons in Nauvoo knew that polygamy was being practiced, quote, to multiply and replenish the earth, completely ignoring the concerted efforts that were made to keep it concealed. Preserving the holy and public persona of Joseph Smith was the most important end game. That was always the goal. And if some babies had to die, and if some women had to suffer horrible abuse and probably very uncomfortable abortion procedures in order to preserve that model of Joseph Smith, so be it, right? He concludes with this. While Bennett may well have performed abortions on women that he and his spiritual wife followers may have impregnated, extrapolating that he also performed abortion of Joseph Smith's plural wives is not supported by the historical record. Except for the lack of descendants. Sarah Pratt said that explicitly. It also does not answer the question, where are the children from all of Joseph's plural wives if intimate relations occurred commonly in those relationships? End quote. And that's it. That's the end of the article. It ends with that question. Where are the children from Joe's plural wives? That's a wonderful question. <sighs> you see, uh, that is one of many reasons why people take issue with Brian Hale's scholarship. He views it all through the rose-colored glasses. Joseph's character can never be tarnished in light of all of the evidence concerning polygamy. When he goes on to say that extrapolating that Bennett also performed abortions for Joseph Smith's plural wives is not supported by, supported by the historical record, I don't think Brian understands that anything Bennett was branded with inevitably splash damages Joe. They were best buds for 18 months. They lived together for 18 months. They practiced the same system of spiritual wifery. It just so happens that after the Bennett meltdown came along, the entire revelation on DNC 132 of polygamy, the whole celestial marriage thing came along, and the differentiation between spiritual wifery of Bennett's practices came into play in order to create this holy version of the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. it's a really complex issue because polygamy is so often only viewed through the lens of doctrinal justification and the male practices of propositioning specific women at specific times. Hales and plenty of other historians have completely disregarded the slain characters lying in the bloody wake of clandestine polygamy. Sarah Pratt was unwillingly victimized by the machine that labeled her an enemy of the religion. She was an apostate as soon as she refused Joe's advances. It was only downhill from there. Why won't women speak out about sexual misconduct when it happens? I just don't get this. This, this, this is, this is why. Whether or not Sarah had any sexual relations, consensual or otherwise, with Joe or Bennett simply doesn't matter because she was already judged in the court of public opinion. 
She was a martyr to transparency with the prophet's sexual indiscretions. She made credible allegations when petitioned by Bennett, who was grinding his axe. We can't, we can't forget that. But she suffered for it for the rest of her life, and her entire legacy has been tarnished with the label of anti-Mormon, all because she was a victim of Joe's relentless sex drive. And look, this is a case where the cover-up becomes worse than the crime. Okay, let's grant, just for the sake of argument, that she and Joe had consensual relations at some point in 1841. They were violating adultery laws, which often carried punishment of castration or imprisonment, but those were notoriously unregulated and unenforced in the day because suddenly if they were enforced, you'd have a lot of politicians and businessmen with no balls, especially after they visited Nauvoo. So let's just be real about that. Where the real issue comes into play, and there was no law against this, was the secrecy and violation of trust and the poor resulting decisions made to preserve that secrecy. Joe attempted to seduce Sarah Pratt after he had sent her husband 4,000 miles away on a mission to a foreign country. Presumably, most of these relationships that were going on in Nafu were without the knowledge or consent of Emma or other people's partners, and this relationship sure smacks of Orson Pratt not knowing about it. Too many secrets, too many lies to keep those secrets. Then, when the extent of Joe's improprieties was revealed, he sicked the attack dogs on everybody speaking out about it. He'd spent so much time in the pulpit lying about his relationships and the order of God-approved marriage that he couldn't just go back on everything, right? It was a sunk cost fallacy. He had lied to thousands of people for over a decade now. He couldn't possibly come clean with a new and everlasting order of marriage without suffering a major loss of followers and a major blow to his public reputation. That's the point here. Joe was an impulsively dishonest human being. He lied about everything, and that started long before he ever claimed to have gold plates given to him by an angel. There is nothing in this man's legacy worth veneration. He built cities, gathered masses of followers, and his religion settled the West. What an ambitious and inspiring legacy, right? But it's all built on a lie. It's all a lie, and people suffered for it. Joseph Smith is deserving of many things, but veneration and reverence are not befitting this human being. Not when we consider the damage left in his wake. Not when we look at the lives he ruined like Sarah Pratt. What Joe was deserving of is what happened next. From the Vogel History of the Church, Volume 5, page 80. Quote, Monday, August 8th, 1842. This forenoon, I was arrested by the deputy sheriff of Adams County and two assistants on a warrant issued by Governor Carlin, founded on a requisition from Governor Reynolds of Missouri, upon the affidavit of ex-Governor Boggs complaining of said Smith as being an accessory before the fact to an assault with an intent to kill made by one O.P. Rockwell on Lilburn W. Boggs. On the night of the 6th of May, A.D. 1842, Brother Rockwell was arrested at the same time as principal. End quote. Governor Carlin had finally made good on the arrest warrant called for by Governor Reynolds on the sworn affidavit of Lilburn Boggs. An extradition writ was soon to follow. Joe and Pistol Pack importer Rockwell were headed to Missouri to answer for the attempted assassination of a public figure during his state senatorial campaign. And you can bet that the state of Missouri plans on convicting on all those old Missouri charges of arson, robbery, and high treason. Now, considering Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell here, his status, he'd probably taken on some new responsibilities since Bennett's departure as Major General of the Nauvoo Legion. He was one of the primary leaders of the Danites, the underground military arm of Mormonism, in some respects a leader of the Daughters of Zion. Port was Joe's fixer and had incredibly high status in Nauvoo. Joe was the head of everything else in the city. They were two of the most powerful men in Nauvoo Mormonism. And now they're headed to the gallows.
All right, everybody. I want to give you guys a quick forecast of what the next several weeks holds for the podcast. I'm recording this week's episode two weeks in advance. Uh, when last week's episode aired uh, is when I was in Missouri for the John Whitmer Historical Association Conference. I'm hoping that I was able to conduct an interesting interview or two with historians to share with all of you at some point. When you're listening to this, I'm currently in Germany right now. So Annie and I have been planning a month-long trip to Europe for over a year now, and the time has finally come. We'll be spending our first two weeks in Germany, and then week number three is in Manchester, UK for the QED conference. So a little bit on QED, if you've never heard of it. QED is basically the premier atheism, skepticism, and science education conference in the world. So I'll be giving a brief presentation at Skeptic Camp on October 12th that's associated with QED. Uh, and that's going to be about the European mission of the Quorum of Apostles and the impact that it had on American history. And in addition to that, I'll be co-hosting the first ever Mormon panel discussion at QED with panelists Greg Retti and Cara Santa Maria, chaired by Andy Wilson of the Incredulous Podcast and organizer of the event. So if you happen to be going to QED, I'd love to meet you there and chat it up at the hotel bar or whatever. And then the final week that we'll be in Europe, we're going to be in Ireland for a conference that Andy's going to be attending, where I am going to relax and tour around distilleries and old bars in Dublin and Galway. So it's a busy month coming up here, and we've been stoked about it for quite a while now, but I'm not leaving all of you high and dry because there ain't no rest for the wicked, am I right, folks? So I have episodes stockpiled for the month of October, and they're going to be releasing on the regular schedule. And I've also built up a backlog of patron-only episodes reading through Bennett's History of the Saints that'll be releasing every Monday on patreon.com slash nakedmormonism. So don't say that I don't work hard for you guys. It's been a lot of 16-hour days for the past few weeks. So with all of this travel coming up, next week's episode and the week after that is going to be a two-part interview that I did with a Mormon history researcher where we cover polygamy at the high level before the Bennett meltdown and then after the meltdown. So Johnny brought a lot of research with him, and I hope that you're going to enjoy those episodes as much as I enjoyed conducting the interview because it puts a lot of these crucial higher level trends together in a cohesive timeline. The week after that, I'm going to try and air an interview that I hope that I conducted while at the John Whitmer conference. There are a few people that I'd really like to nail down for the those interviews whose work I've been consuming in hopes that they'll talk to me about it, but we're going to have to see. I mean, I'm I'm like, recording this in the past two weeks before like a week before I go to the John Whitmer conference and talking about what I did do but it's airing two weeks out. it's a mess anyway regardless the week after that um, is going to be October 25th that's when I'm planning on putting together a travel log to release on this regular feed along with a little bit about how awesome QED was so that's for the regular feed but there are perks if you're signed up at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. Everybody who supports the show will be getting a number of travel logs for the whole month of October about some of the cool history sites that we're visiting. And I'll share the history that I've learned that I know nothing about right now. In Germany alone, we're going to be in Dresden for World War II history, Münster for the Münster Rebellion history, and Wittenberg for uh, the Protestant Revolution history, among many other amazing places. This is my first trip to Europe, and we are making the absolute best of it for a person like myself who is a history junkie. So I desire all to receive those travel logs, but only those worthy few who pay their tithes to be a member of the NAMO Club. <laughs> you know how this works, people. I mean, it's nothing new. I just won't ask you about your masturbation habits or damn you to outer darkness for speaking out against Ground Gnomes LLC. Then we're going to pick back up on November 1st, where we left off with Joe and Port in custody of the Adams County Sheriff amidst the fallout from this Bennett meltdown. What happens next? I guess you'll have to wait a month to find out. Unless you're listening to this in the backlog, then you can just jump ahead and I'll tell you all about how awesome the trip to Europe was. So I, I guess that's about it. Um, you know, this is kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> you won't feel it on your end because you're still getting episodes every week, but I'm kind of signing off for a month. You know, I'm going to have access to Wi-Fi most nights, but I don't plan on doing social media stuff because why? Right? I mean, a vacation with social media isn't a vacation. So 
how can my mind be in Europe with my body when it's tethered back to here? So anyway, um, I'm going to be back on the clock of social media and access to emails and everything when QED hits, and that's going to start October 12th. So I'm going to leave the keys of the kingdom in the trustworthy hands of our social media genius, Julie Briscoe, and part with a huge thanks to her for keeping the discussion lively over on social media. Of course, be sure to give her a follow at the real Emma Hale. You'd be surprised at the conversations that unfold among Emma, Porter Rockwell, Brigham Young, and the disembodied head of John C. Bennett. It's really fun. So with all of that, thank you all so much for tuning in, and I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as production assistant and director of social media, and Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer. Music is produced by Jason Camo from a alloststateofmind.com and is used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnome Studios, LLC. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved.